without further ado, I'll get started. So today we're going to talk about how to sell on WeChat uh, in 2020 because WeChat has been evolving quite a bit over the last few years. Um, quickly about me, I'm Thomas. I'm the co-founder of an agency called Walk the Chat. I have five years of experience uh, running this agency. Uh, we help some big brands and some small brands sell in China, mostly via WeChat and other social networks. Uh, and these clients include big companies like Cisco, McLaren, Nestle, also a lot of small companies, uh, which we help break into the Chinese market. So hopefully, no matter the size of your company, you will find something interesting for you. This webinar means to apply to very big brands, but also small brands, uh, which are trying to get started. And before that, I was doing some consulting and education stuff, which you're not so interested about, so I, I won't bore you with my uh, fascinating personal life. Uh, so, uh, about the agenda, we'll start very simple with what is WeChat um, in terms of the features of the network. Uh, we'll, this will be very brief, don't worry, I, I won't bore you too much with that. Uh, we'll talk about WeChat accounts, the different types of accounts and their features, and we'll talk about WeChat mini programs. So these are the more basic parts of the webinar. Uh, so Next part will be about WeChat influencer marketing. This is a part you will find familiar if you've seen the webinar two weeks ago. And then we'll talk about WeChat advertising, much more in depth than we did two weeks ago. Uh, and we'll talk about selling cross-border on WeChat, which was a very uh, common question we received from the last webinar. And finally, we'll talk about new WeChat features, uh, short videos, live streaming, and to which extent they are relevant. So I get started with uh, what is uh, what is WeChat. Uh, so as you know, WeChat is the largest social network in China. Uh, although its growth is slowing down because it's starting to saturate the market, uh, it has uh, around 1.1 uh, billion uh, monthly active users um, as of as of today. Uh, it contains three sections. One is a chat section, which is very similar to Facebook Messenger or WhatsApp. The second section is the WeChat moments, which is the WeChat timeline, very similar to the Facebook timeline that you might be used to. And the last se section is the WeChat wallet, which contains links to a bunch of services uh, like payments and e-commerce. This is a section which is more specific and innovative about WeChat. We'll get to talk more about that. Uh, in terms of, uh, of uh, size and growth, so it's definitely the largest social network in China but it's starting to have some very serious contenders. Uh, it has uh, 765 million daily active users, but this number has been slightly decreasing, ever so slightly, just 0.3% year over year. But you can see that WeChat is kind of getting to its level of maturity, while some new contenders, especially short video platforms like Douyin and Kuaisho, uh, have been growing very fast uh, at the pace of more than 150% uh, year over year. Uh, and their usage in terms of time is quite similar to the one of WeChat, around 80 minutes per day. Uh, of course, people don't spend uh, necessarily uh, time both on Douyin and Kuaisho. Most people just spend time on one of these apps. Otherwise, it will add up to way too much time watching short videos. Uh, and if you look at the specificities of WeChat, it's the network which has the highest retention by very far. and uh, the highest uh, ratio of daily active users against monthly active users. So most of the people who use WeChat use, use it daily. They never stop using it. Uh, and it's also the number one uh, channel for promotion of more expensive items. And we'll talk much more about that in the section about influencers. Um, interestingly, uh, WeChat is also the biggest source of traffic for Taobao. Uh, so if you look at uh, the sources of traffic uh, from social to Taobao, uh, WeChat is by far number one. And it's especially interesting because WeChat is the only one which is actually blocked by Taobao. They, have, they block each other and you can't directly link uh, between WeChat and Taobao. But if you compare to some other networks which have direct integration with Taobao, such as uh, Douyin uh, or Xiaohongshu, uh, you will see that these networks actually don't, uh, don't add up to the um, to the power of WeChat in terms of influence. So this really shows that even if the network is pretty much reaching maturity and is not gonna grow as fast as it used to, uh, it remains very powerful for marketing 
and it remains the number one uh, uh, tool to spread the word about your brand. Uh, you can use other tools, of course, but you can't really not do WeChat if you're serious about your marketing in China. Uh, so we thought about how brands can be visible on WeChat. Uh, so they can be, be visible by creating what's called WeChat official accounts. Uh, WeChat official accounts are WeChat brand accounts. Uh, and interestingly, they appear on the chat uh, version of WeChat, on the chat section of WeChat, not on the timeline like Facebook pages, which would publish uh, some updates, who, which would then appear on the timeline. In the case of WeChat, uh, the WeChat official account send out messages which are received very similarly to as if a friend was sending you a message. And there are in particular two types of accounts which are used for marketing. One is called service accounts, one is called subscription accounts. And the service accounts appear directly as friends. And this, while the subscription accounts appear in a nested folder. So I have a short video here to explain it. Uh, here, if I open a service account, I can see a list of all of the messages which were sent to, by this account. This is our account from all the chat. And I can click into the articles to read them. And then you have the subscription folder. If you click into this folder, then you will see a list of all of the articles published by all the subscription accounts that the user is following. So instead of being one account which appears in the timeline, people have to get into this folder and then they can open uh, the specific ac uh, article written by uh, one specific subscription, subscription account. Uh, so it's uh, one level uh, lower in terms of nesting if you want to check the content, while for service accounts, it appears more directly. So of course, it's a trade-off. If you look at the main two types of accounts for marketing, subscription and service, uh, the subscription account will be able to have, we have low, lower visibility, they will be in this hidden folder, uh, but they will be able to send out more notifications, one per day, one push notification per day, while service account can send one per week, also on average. In fact, it's four push notifications uh, per month. Um, in both cases, everyone can follow uh, uh, subscription and service accounts. Uh, one important difference, which will be relevant to you if you're calling from outside China, is that subscription accounts cannot be created by overseas entities. So if you're talking about the overseas entities, then you will have to go for a service account anyway. Uh, and in practice, uh, subscription accounts are used mostly by uh, media uh, for daily notifications. Uh, so this will be uh, influencers or some uh, newspapers who really need to publish on a daily basis. And more, most brands who use WeChat for e-commerce uh, will use, use service accounts. But anyway, if your corporation is not registered in mainland China, you don't have a choice and service account will be your number one choice. Uh, there are two other types of accounts. One I will not talk about at all today, it's WeChat enterprise accounts, because they are mostly used for internal management inside companies to um, deal with communication between employees or between employees and suppliers. And uh, then we have uh, mini programs, uh, which I will talk extensively ab about because they're not a choice between mini programs and other accounts. They are complementary because they enable to create uh, these apps within WeChat. Um, and so I, I'll dive right in to uh, mini programs. Uh, so mini programs uh, are these kind of apps included within WeChat. So you can access them very easily from the homepage of WeChat where you can see a list of all the favorite mini programs you might have. This is a mini program from one of our clients and you can see it has kind of native transitions as you click into it, you can get in a very smooth way uh, between the different pages. You can automatically, uh, automatically get the address uh, of the user uh, from, uh, the user can directly get the address from WeChat. And an interesting feature is a very good integration with influencers. So here you have an influencer post and you can see inside the post, I'm gonna be able to click uh, directly inside a product and then from the article, I get directly to the e-commerce experience. I can, in one click, get to checkout. The users can access the, can input the address directly because it's stored within WeChat, and then it's just one click to payment. So that's the power of mini program is you're gonna have these experiences where you're gonna be able to take users from an influencer, um, an influencer uh, um, uh, article directly into an e-commerce experience, and there will be only three, four clicks from discovering the product on the post of the, of the influencer 
and checking out, which is exceptional and you would not be able to achieve that with any other um, 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 setup, uh, without a, not with a website, not with anything else. Um, in terms of the way mini programs are built technically, uh, I don't want to get too technical here, but just to give you a sense because it will help you understand what do you control when you build a mini program. So if you look at the, the way um, websites were built uh, 20 years ago, uh, they were built as what I would call a traditional website, which is simply a browser, uh, it give it a, a domain address and it will send a request to this domain to a server and the server will send the page back to the browser and then the browser will display it. And all of the logic is done by the server. Um, about maybe 10 years ago, uh, there was a shift toward uh, web apps. Uh, web apps basically put more logic in the browser, which means when you first load the website, uh, you, let's say the e-commerce website, you download all of, the all of the logic of the website. And then when you open a new product, instead of asking for the entire page, the browser is just going to ask for the data from this specific product and then display it uh, to your browser. So it's giving more power to the browser and it's making websites faster because then each time you get to a new page, instead of having to ask for the page one, page two, page three, you just ask for the little bit of data that you need. So maybe just the pricing and pictures of the product instead of having to load all of the logic. So this makes a website a bit faster, a bit more efficient. And a WeChat mini program is essentially that. So it's just a front end, which is controlled by WeChat and which is then called calling an API uh, where you can get just the data you need for each phase of the mini program. Um, why is this important? Because it, what's the part of the mini program which is hosted on Tencent is only the front end. It's only the, the part which is displayed on the WeChat browser. And all of the data of the mini program, you can still own. So it's quite different to run something on mini programs compared to selling on Tmall or on JD. Because on Tmall and JD, you just, you don't have any control. You just uh, basically set a, a store in their mall and then they give you the data they give you. Uh, but in the case of WeChat mini programs, you're going to build your own front end with a language given by Tencent, which gives them you quite a bit of freedom. And then you're going to be able to host and store all of the data from the mini program. So it's important to have this in mind, especially if you're thinking of mini program from a technical perspective to understand what they are exactly. They are not just, uh, it's not comparable to Tencent, uh, to, uh, sorry, to Tmall or JD. Uh, they are really an ecosystem for building applications and you host all of the data from these applications. So pros and cons of the mini programs, in particular, if you compare them to websites, which can be accessed via uh, WeChat browser, which we call HTML5 websites. Uh, so they are faster because uh, the logic is, uh, is hosted by, by uh, WeChat directly on the front end. Uh, they look very good when shared in groups. Uh, they are easy to integrate with influencer campaigns, as we mentioned. Uh, they are very convenient to access. Uh, as we saw, we just had to do a swipe down in order to access all of the list of mini programs. Uh, they have native transitions, as we saw these very nice, fancy looking transitions. Uh, the downsides are that they're limited in terms of size. So the code base of the mini program can only be 10 megs. So if you're trying to build something very complex, uh, it might, you might uh, reach some limits after a while. Um, the code is limited by the fact that you have to use a programming language of Tencent. They give a framework which is based on JavaScript, and you have need your developers to actually uh, learn this framework uh, so you can build mini programs. Uh, they need to be approved by Tencent before being published. So it's a bit like the App Store. You can't just push a fix if you have a bug or a change to make, and then it will show up. Uh, it can be a, a long process to get approved by Tencent, especially for overseas mini programs. They have some random uh, tests, which uh, random checks, which can last up to two weeks. So uh, most of the publications should be passed within a couple of hours, but once in a while, they're gonna have a long check on one of the main programs, and then they will look more in depth into the code, and this review will take two weeks to go through, and during two weeks, you won't be able to make updates. So there, is, there are some challenges uh, with this re review process. Uh, they can't be shared on WeChat moments, and of course, they work only inside of WeChat. Uh, just gonna quickly look at the question panel to see if there is any burning question linked with uh, mini programs. Um, uh, 
some one attendee is asking, I'm just gonna answer some of the questions because I think they might make sense for a lot of people. Uh, what budget is reasonable for WeChat mini program which can accept ordering and payment? Uh, so this really depends on uh, whether or not you're registered in China. Uh, our solution is for cross borders. It's among the most expensive solution and we charge 500 US dollars per month. But if you have a local company, you can use solutions like Yodzan, which are quite affordable. Uh, Yodzan is around 5,000 RMB per year, uh, which is which will bring you around 800 US dollars per year to have a fully functioning WeChat stores. So WeChat stores can be pretty cheap. Um, and uh, Stefan is asking, what is the difference between a WeChat shop and a WeChat mini program? A WeChat mini program is uh, basically the type of app which is built within WeChat. A WeChat mini program could be uh, something else than a shop. It could be simply a, a web, or it could be a booking system to book a hotel room or to book um, a training in a gym. This could all be WeChat mini programs. WeChat mini program is just a type of app, it's a type of programming language. Uh, and WeChat mini programs can be WeChat shops. A WeChat shop is a shop which is within WeChat, which can be a mini program, or which can be um, uh, just a website optimized for WeChat, which is equipped with WeChat payment, WeChat login, etc. Uh, so WeChat mini programs can be WeChat shop or not, and WeChat shops can be mini programs or they can, they can be HTML5. In practice, if you're running a WeChat shop, you will want it to be a mini program because this will be the most efficient way to get orders because of the reasons we mentioned all of the advantages uh, in terms of integration with WeChat. Um, yeah, so this was a just a few. As I said, I already have 23 questions on the on the on the panel, so I, I will skip for now the rest of the question. I will get back to them at the end. So don't worry if you ask a question. Uh, I will address that later. I just wanted to address these two questions for clarity. Uh, and I see some questions in the chat. If you uh, if you have questions, please write them in the Q&A session. Uh, I won't answer questions which appear in, in the chat because then it's too complicated for me to manage. There is a specific section inside the webinar for Q&A. Uh, I will slightly promote our company. I promise not to do it too much during this webinar. We try to make the webinars very educational and not too much about promotion. But it just happens that yesterday, uh, our integration with Shopify uh, just got listed on the App Store of Shopify. Uh, so it's something to celebrate. Uh, and, um, and so we are the first uh, sales channel which enables uh, companies to sell uh, via, um, via WeChat through a Shopify store. So it's possible to integrate between Shopify uh, or Magento and the WeChat mini program. Uh, basically, you just need to have the data synchronized between the two. So the way we do it is we export all of the products from Shopify and Magento, or some of the products you can select in the sales channel what you want to uh, make available for the WeChat store and put them in your WeChat mini program. It will synchronize prices, inventory, fulfillment information, shipping zones. And then when an order is done on WeChat, it will show up on Shopify when you fulfill or Magento. And when you fulfill this order in Shopify and Magento, it will send the shipping information back to WeChat and then send a notification to the end user to let them know the order is shipped. And uh, this, we provide two front end. Uh, we provide a WeChat a mini program front end, and we provide a HTML5 front end, which is accessible within WeChat, but also outside WeChat. You can make orders on Weibo and other uh, social networks using Alipay and uh, SMS login and Weibo login. Uh, so just to explain quickly, this is a way you can integrate um, this uh, Shopify uh, and Magento and WeChat mini programs. Uh, in practice, for Magento, you don't need to use our system because um, uh, in practice, uh, Magento is an open source system, so you could build your own integration. Uh, for Shopify, you would almost have to use our system because uh, we are the only sales channel which is approved by Shopify to do that. And I don't think, uh, I think Shopify is gonna remove private sales channel very soon. Uh, so basically, in order to have a sales channel um, to to communicate with Shopify, between Shopify and WeChat, you would have to use our system until there is a competitor which appears and uh, does something similar. But for now, we're, we're the first ones and we just published yesterday. Uh, and there are a bunch of advantages, of course, of uh, using uh, WeChat mini program instead of um, Shopify or Magento if you're publishing in China. 
I won't get through them again, but the same things we mentioned before, login methods, uh, uh, login, uh, uh, automati automated, automated login via, via widget login, check out, check out experience is smoother, uh, automatic ID verification, checking the real ID of the Chinese users, uh, notification, transition speed, uh, payments, uh, integration with influencer campaigns. Uh, if you would just link uh, a Shopify store, a Magento store uh, to, um, to uh, WeChat without trying to localize it uh, for China, it, it would not really work. Uh, so this was for, for WeChat mini programs. Hopefully it gives you a sense of uh, what they are and how it's going to be used to sell. Now we're going to deep dive a bit more into uh, what, are the, um, what are the ways you can use this to sell uh, after simply um, after simply uh, setting up, because of course, just having a WeChat mini program will not help you to sell. Uh, WeChat is not a search-based ecosystem. So just, uh, we have some clients selling just by having the mini program, but usually it's small volumes. It's when you start to do promotion around the mini program that you start getting successful. So this is the part which is very similar to two weeks ago. So if, um, if uh, you saw that already, don't worry, the next part about advertising will be new. Uh, so if you uh, want to market uh, to China, uh, you, you will focus mostly on influencers because uh, we'll talk more about this. These are the most efficient way to get good return on investment. Um, the uh, influencer marketing is very similar to the way you might do it. If you're operating from outside China, you will identify the influencers who are relevant to your brand. You would give the products first in order to get the, the influencer familiar with your product and see whether or not they provide free exposure. Uh, and then you will uh, arrange uh, paid campaigns uh, with these influencers uh, by sponsoring uh, the campaign and then getting direct links between the influencer campaign and the mini program. The way we described earlier, it's very easy to integrate this influencer article so that there is a direct link to the product, which would not be possible with HTML5. You can't have a link between an influencer post taking people directly to a web page is blocked by WeChat. So you would have to do that via a mini program. Uh, and then you would encourage the influencer to keep writing about your brand after the campaign is over. Um, yeah, so, and the interesting thing is, it's also, as I, we said, the, the best network to promote products which have a larger amount, uh, uh, order amount. Um, WeChat is actually the most expensive social network in terms of cost for influencer impressions. Uh, you would have to pay um, more than a, a, um, sorry, more than one RMB per impression. So if you want to get, uh, if you invest one million RMB uh, in WeChat, you will get 900,000 uh, impressions on average. Uh, while if you invest one million RMB on TikTok, uh, so on Doyin, the, lo the local version of, of TikTok, you would get 15.3 uh, million uh, impressions. So more than uh, uh, like 16, 17 times more impressions uh, on Doyin than on WeChat. So if you look at that, you might think, so why would I invest in WeChat influencers? They're so expensive. Uh, why don't I invest all of my money in Doyin, Weibo, uh, Kwaisho, cheaper networks? The reason for that, is that uh, the product price you can you can uh, sell uh, on uh, WeChat is much higher than on, on Doyin. Uh, typically, for our clients, we sell uh, products which are typically ranging uh, from very cheap products, which might be just 50, 100 RMB, uh, to uh, 15,000 RMB per product. And this would be almost impossible to do via a network, for instance, like uh, Doyin. Uh, if you look at uh, TikTok doing, if you look at doing TikTok, the max you could reasonably expect to sell uh, in terms of order amount via Doin would be around 200 RMB. Uh, and the target customers on Doin also would be, of course, much younger because the user base of Doin is much younger, while WeChat pretty much reaches everyone in China, no matter the age. Everyone uses WeChat. Uh, the purchasing channel uh, would be different, of course. Uh, and the WeChat does not take um, uh, commission. Uh, you would just have to pay the payment processing, processing fee. Uh, while if you're selling via, via Doin, uh, you will have to pay between 2% to 10%. Uh, either to Doin if you're selling through the store inside Doin or to Tmall if you're uh, selling through a Tmall store. 
and on our own platform uh, in April, uh, the average order on our platform was uh, around 287 uh, US dollars. Uh, and we had some much more expensive orders, we had some much cheaper orders, uh, but this gives you a sense of the fact that uh, WeChat can be used to sell relatively expensive products. It's 2,000 RMB on average, while on Doyen, your average order would be somewhere around 100 RMB. Uh, so the, as I said, in terms of uh, uh, marketing via influencers, you would start with seeding, with gifting, and gifting is a good way to prepare future paid campaigns. It also can bring very good results in itself. Um, this is an example for one of our clients, Cote Ciel, where uh, we got regularly some mentions uh, worth, worth uh, dozens of thousands of RMB. So in order to assess the price of a mention, we would calculate how much an influencer would charge if we were to pay for this placement uh, as part of a paid campaign. Uh, but by gifting very often, uh, the influencers would give this uh, placement for free. So for instance, you might have some influencer posts which are gonna be five different products they recommend for the week or the day or the month. Uh, and if to be featured, you would have to pay. But if you're lucky enough that they like the product, uh, then you can get this, this, um, this uh, placement for free. And these play placements are typically worth uh, 20, 30, 50, 100 RMB or more, depending on the size of the influencer. So we try to give to a mix of small and big influencers the smaller influencers, of course, are less, uh, the, the placement is not worth as much, but they are more likely to post. <coughs> the big ones are very unlikely to post for free, but if they do, the upside is really big because we can make the equivalent of dozens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of RMB of free promotion if the influencer really likes the product. So we did that for another client, for instance, Hunter Books, Boots, and uh, generated uh, 100,000 RMB within a month. Uh, simply by gifting uh, 20 products. So this is 100,000 RMB of equivalent amount of promotion and 3 million free impressions on WeChat and Weibo via product gifting. So quite a significant ROI. Uh, after you're done with that, you will start working on paid campaigns. And this is where you will get the real return on investment. Usually seeding doesn't give you per se ROI. In term, it doesn't give you a return on investment in terms of sales unless you do it for a very long time on a big scale. We have some clients who are very profitable just by doing seeding, but your product really has to be exceptional and you have to do it at scale over a long period of time. And after a while you will start to see real benefits and you can, you can run a completely profitable operation just by doing seeding without paid campaigns. If you want to accelerate the pace though, you will have to run paid campaigns at some point. So in order to do that, to do that uh, you will pay the influencers, they will write a dedicated article about you on their account, and they will put a direct link to the mini program. Uh, for these campaigns, we can get really good ROI. Uh, usually, it can go all the way up to 500 or sometimes even 800% ROI. This is not frequent. Uh, usually, the return on investment on paid campaigns ranges between 100 to 500%. And for a client who's performing well, uh, if we can get 250% return, so if we pay 10,000 US dollars, we get 25,000 US dollars of sales on a consistent basis, and then it's very really good. Uh, it's, it's hard to get much higher than that purely via WeChat. If you want to get a 500% ROI on a consistent basis, you would have to have a very mature Tmall store, uh, which has been running for a few years, has really good ratings, uh, good rankings, uh, as that's when you can get a bit more value for your invested dollar. Uh, on campaigns because Simul Store will have a lot of extra costs for in order to run them. So the ROI, overall ROI might not be as high, but in terms of dollar invested by campaign, the best uh, the best you can expect around on WeChat will be around 500%. And uh, the best on average, I would say, is around 250%. That would be a pretty solid return to get on a consistent basis. Uh, one of your questions might be, how do I find these influencers? Uh, so one, uh, there are a lot of databases which uh, exist. Uh, the biggest one is called NewRank, NewRank.cn. So it's, it's in Chinese, unfortunately, but you can use Google Translate to navigate it. It's not that complex. Um, and uh, by going on this platform, uh, you can see a ranking of influencers and also a ranking of influencers for different industries, So which is very interesting. Uh, you can also, if you are already identified an influencer, use this platform to get all of the data about this influencer. 
and see uh, how their views or how their comments engagement has been evolving over time. Uh, you should also, as you start more in depth talking about the influencer, uh, you should ask them more information about what is displayed in the dashboard. So all of the influencers, because they are running WeChat official accounts, they have a dashboard with some metrics and you should ask questions and ask them to send screenshots so you can identify some trends. Uh, in particular, if the influencer has uh, fake data, you will see some spikes of reads in the content. If you look at uh, the, con the reading over time, you will see that suddenly there is one or several peaks of content because they're having robots trying to boost the number of views. And this will be hard for them to completely hide. Uh, most of the robots are not sophisticated enough to create a smooth curve of reads. Uh, and a lot of influencers actually might have some fake views. Uh, most of influencers who have fake uh, views or fake followers don't have 100% fake. It's a percentage of their followers or their views which might be fake. So you always have to double check because even if the engagement seems real, uh, it is quite possible that they still have fake followers because simply they're selling you a 200,000, uh, uh, 500,000 followers, but actually they only have 200,000 who are real and 300K are fake. And you don't want to pay a 500K price tag for an influencer who only has 40% of the followers. So you, you have to do this due diligence even if the influencer seems legit at first sight. Uh, another interesting thing to ask for the backend is the heat map data. Uh, so basically is how uh, fast, how far people are going into the article. This will also help you to position your action calls if you're putting stuff in the, in, inside the campaign to know that if the influencer has 20,000 views uh, and you're only half of the people get to the end of the article uh, and your action call is that at the end of the article, uh, then you know that you're only paying for uh, 10,000 uh, views in practice, not 20,000. So looking at the heat map can help you know exactly what you're paying for. Um, another interesting metric is the source of followers. So you can see where are the followers coming from for each article. And this can be helpful to identify that the uh, influencer is healthy. If the, the, the following is healthy, there should be a mix of people coming from uh, uh, official accounts, so directly reading from the influencer, by uh, uh, sharing from friends, by WeChat moments, by the WeChat timeline. These three should be more or less balanced. Uh, if you see a lot of people reading from the history, uh, the, which is like the old post, uh, this will be a sign of fake, um, fake views because a lot of the robots, in order to read, uh, to add some reads into the, the um, accounts, they would go through the history, they would open the account, check out the old posts and then add some reads. So if you see that 25, 30% of reads are coming from history, uh, it means that most likely they're using fake data. Um, and we put uh, together uh, some rules of thumb, so uh, I will quickly go through that. It's a bit uh, boring to read, but uh, if you bear with me, um, the, the KOL quotation should be somewhere somewhere between 10,000 to 80,000 RMB because this is where you're going to get the highest ROI. Uh, below that, the influencer is not going to be influ influential enough, uh, so they're not going to convert very well. Above that, they're going to be too influential, so they're starting to be a bit overpriced, and you're going to see a decrease in return on investment. So this usually amounts to around 5,000 to 80,000 views, uh, open rate uh, between 1 to 10%. A number of percentage of article likes above 0.1%. Uh, the top comment should be around 0.05% of the of the likes to 0.3%. So these are all metrics which help you identify healthy engagement, uh, absence of fake uh, or fake comments or fake uh, views. Uh, com com comments should be diverse. Comment rate should be between 0.1% and 0.01%. Uh, you should ask for conversion data from previous uh, campaign. Or you should look at the things we mentioned, conversion uh, traffic source, uh, the view over time, uh, the heat map. Uh, you can look at past advertisers, who are the brands who worked with this influencer in the past, and check whether there is repeat collaboration. If people have been working several times with the same influencer, of course, it's a sign of high quality. So this is the number one thing you should try to flag. Um, of course, you should make sure that the 
KOL is very demanding in terms of posting original content. If they just accept to write whatever you want, it's a red flag in terms of the quality of the influencer. Uh, and as we mentioned, source of views and are, always start with gifting with the influencer so you can build this relationship. Um, so this was for influencers. Um, another interesting topic when it comes to WeChat marketing uh, is WeChat ads. So a lot of, especially foreign brands, don't understand why we talk so much about influencers uh, and not so much about advertising because if you're running uh, a business in Europe or in the US or in other part of the world, most likely you rely heavily on programmatic advertising on Facebook or Instagram ads and you might work with influencers, but maybe programmatic might be 70% of your digital or 80% of your digital budget. And uh, maybe influencers are 20% or less of the budget. And in China, it's really the other way around. So now we're going to look a bit at the advertising format and how much they cost uh, in order to get a sense of, of why this is the case. Uh, so WeChat ads, you have three main type of ads. Uh, WeChat timeline ads, which appear in the WeChat timeline. Banner ads, which appear in articles. And which has mini program ads, which appear on which has mini programs, as the name suggests. So the timeline ads they are very much like your typical uh, Facebook timeline ad. They appear in the in the which has moments, um, and people click on them. When they click on them, usually they can't be directed directly to a web page. They are taken to a landing page, which introduces the offer. And then on this landing page, you will have one or several action calls that people can click. And then when they click this action call. It will take them maybe to a WeChat mini program, or to a store, or it will take them to an app store if, if your ad is about uh, game promotions. Um, you're gonna have another type of ads, which is uh, WeChat mini program advertising. So WeChat mini program advertising, instead of being shown on the timeline, they are shown in a mini program. So when developers develop the mini program, especially if it's gaming, uh, they can decide to put a special code to say, at this spot inside my mini program, I'm willing to display some ads. And they, it works like a, a banner on websites when you used to have a lot of these and you still have these on some, some newspapers today uh, where you have um, advertising and if people click, then the website would get a share of the revenue. The same you might have when you read your online newspaper. Um, um, and, uh, and this is the same for mini programs. When people want to, um, so a developer can decide to show some ads, then uh, the ads will be displayed where the developer decided. And if someone clicks on this ad, WeChat will get part of the revenue and the developer of the mini program will get part of the revenue. Uh, and they can be inside the mini program itself. They can be as pop-ups which appear, for instance, in a game or when you're reading some content, or they can be uh, full screen interstitial ads. So this would be like, for instance, you're playing a game and uh, you want to gain some additional credits within the game, some, some points or items or whatever. And uh, the game will offer you to watch a full screen ad uh, in exchange for some points. And uh, you watch a 15 second ad and then you get your credits and you keep playing the game. Um, and uh, the last type of ads is called which are banner advertising. And these are the bottom of other articles. So this is similar to uh, which are mini program. If you're writing on WeChat, you can say that you allow Tencent to display ads on the content you write, and then you will get a share of the revenue. And when people uh, click this, um, this content, they can be taken to a website, they can be taken to a mini program, they can also be invited to uh, follow uh, official accounts. This is a good way to get followers. Um, in practice, uh, if you find, look, for instance, uh, at follower acquisition, we could use different metric, but for our acquisition is an easy one to compare. Uh, the WeChat mini programs is by far the cheapest type of advertising. So the WeChat moment ads is extremely expensive. You would pay 35 RMB per follower. So this is more, more than $5 USD in order to get one follower on WeChat. Um, and uh, so this really shows that WeChat moment advertising is really about PR, it's really about marketing. Uh, is not really about return on investment. Uh, the WeChat banner ads, we don't use them that much. You can use them a little bit to do some follower acquisition, uh, maybe using the, the, the cheapest of them. Uh, and the one we use the most for follower acquisition are WeChat mini programs because they're the cheapest. So it really depends what you're trying to achieve. If you're trying to really be, make a big splash in terms of marketing, but you don't care about ROI by any means, 
and then which ad moments can be a good uh, place to to start. Um, you can also run profitable uh, ads on which ad moments, but it's very technical. It's possible, and we do it for, for some clients, uh, but it's very challenging because of the cost of it. So you need to be very very uh, refined in the targeting, and which new programs are much easier to handle because they're cheaper and you can use them simply to gain followers. And this can be a good way to create initial momentum for your account by running these ads. Um, the advertising cost has also been decreasing lately because of COVID-19. People have been spending more time online. And for some of these advertising formats, as uh, after the advertising costs, the, the cost per click has been decreasing by half and sometimes by as much as uh, divided by three. So definitely, uh, um, uh, opportune time for you if you want to run advertising for acquisition of followers. Uh, right now, the costs are lower than they used to be simply because people have been spending more time online since the beginning of the outbreak. And even now that things are back to normal in China, there's still a higher online engagement than they used to be. Uh, another interesting uh, feature of widget ads uh, is the ability to do retargeting. Uh, so retargeting is not working on WeChat the same way it's working on Facebook. So it's not, you don't retarget people who are, have visited your, your website uh, on WeChat. What you can do is, because you have a partnership between WeChat and GD, uh, for the people who have been visiting uh, your store on GD, putting products in cart or making orders, you can retarget them on WeChat. This can be to ask them to go complete their purchase. Or it could be if they already made purchase to make them into followers, and then you can uh, send them push notifications when you release more new products and, and create some repurchasing behavior this way. Uh, also, if people have had any interaction with your WeChat mini programs, you can also put them into retargeting, um, re retargeting uh, audiences. This is particularly useful if you're making a, a big campaign with a big influencer. Um, and then you're, you're going to collect basically all of the IDs of the people who uh, visit the mini program through the influencer campaigns. But a good influencer campaign, like if it's really good, it would convert around four or five percent. It's, it's hard to get much more than that if the product is a bit expensive. So you're gonna have 95% of your people who are, they might have visited the mini program, but they actually have not purchased. Uh, so that, that's basically the reason why you would use uh, these retargeting ads uh, to then have, have them either become followers so you can push them a uh, product in the future and they will be very, very high quality followers because these are people who just followed an uh, influencer campaign talking about your brand or by asking them to complete the purchase, especially you can retarget them uh, if they have products in the cart. So you can uh, give them an additional discount, an additional incentive or just a reminder to complete the purchase that they might have started but not finished during the influencer campaign. And in practice, that's what we do the most uh, with, uh, with WeChat ads is this kind of retargeting because this is uh, fairly efficient. Um, in terms of, uh, we also use WeChat ads for some other purposes. We use it for, uh, for uh, uh, app downloads. This was a campaign with uh, Virgin Mobile and uh, sometimes to promote some coupon to drive e-commerce. Uh, this is, um, this is um, a campaign for the brand uh, Camper. Um, in practice, uh, if you really want to go for the cheapest cost of acquisition, uh, you might want to look outside of purely WeChat. So even within Tencent, uh, Tencent actually has a very rich, very efficient advertising network, but which extends outside of WeChat. So you have WeChat, but you also have other properties, something things like QQ Video, Tencent News, QZone. So QQ Video is a video service, so YouTube of Tencent. Uh, Tencent News is a news service, as the name suggests, and QZone is a social network, which is based on uh, the, the messaging app QQ, which was the predecessor of WeChat. Uh, and if you use this uh, networks, you will get much uh, cheaper cost of acquisition. So I, I, in the Virgin Mobile uh, uh, campaign I just showed, the cost per installation was around eight, eight US dollars. Uh, if we do uh, similar campaigns on the broader Tencent network, and we try to uh, promote games or apps, usually we can get down at least to two or three dollars uh, per install. So it's about, um, about uh, almost three times cheaper than what we had on uh, on WeChat. And these days, because as I said, uh, this is an older case study, but uh, these days because we have um, uh, cheaper cost of acquisition because of COVID-19, uh, actually we can get installed of application for around $1. Uh, 
So it's, uh, it's much, much cheaper than what you would achieve uh, with WeChat. So this is a bit outside of the scope of strictly WeChat marketing, but just to give you a sense that if you're marketing using the Tencent ecosystem, uh, and if your goal is not just to get WeChat followers, but you're looking at something broader than like app installs or selling services or sales, uh, in this case, you might want to look at the broader ecosystem of Tencent, which is very interesting and more cost effective because the, it's not a, as uh, it's not a, a high real estate price such as uh, WeChat. And um, okay, to finish, I have two more sections. Uh, we're running a bit late, but I'm always running a bit late, so hopefully you're not, you're not shocked. Um, uh, we'll talk a bit about cross-border on WeChat, and we'll talk very briefly about live streaming and uh, and um, and uh, short videos on WeChat, and then we'll uh, we'll uh, do the questions. And we have uh, five, 56 questions waiting now, so I will do as much as I can. Uh, I won't might not be able to finish all of the questions. So on cross-border, so the first thing to say about cross-border on WeChat is that uh, WeChat mini programs, cross-border mini programs on WeChat uh, have some uh, regulations uh, and you can't sell any kind of products on, um, on uh, WeChat uh, cross-border mini programs. Uh, this is true even if some products are possible to sell cross-border uh, on Tmall or by Chinese law. But uh, WeChat has a more, uh, it has a stricter set of rules uh, than the general cross-border uh, ecosystem in China. So most of the clients we have are in this clothing, cosmetics, uh, jewelry uh, categories. Uh, this is an exhaustive list of all of the categories as of today. As I said, I will send the slides, so you don't need to screenshot or, or write, uh, furiously write down everything. You get everything uh, in your inbox. Um, and uh, you can see some categories here are missing. Uh, in particular, uh, there is no FMB uh, category, so it's, you can't actually sell FMB products cross-border uh, via WeChat. Um, spirits like alcohol is also not an option, although it's now possible uh, to sell it on Tmall and other platforms, but not via WeChat mini programs. So uh, there are some limitations here in terms of what you can do uh, selling via WeChat mini programs. Uh, so when you I say selling cross-border, what I, do I mean? Uh, I mean that you're going to settle payments via WeChat cross-border payment. Uh, which means that the end customer is going to pay in RMB uh, via WeChat and you will receive money into a overseas currency, which might be euros or USD or British pounds or whatever currency you have. And uh, WeChat will charge around 2% commission on this cross border transaction, including the, the Forex, so the conversion to foreign currencies. Um, so how to set up on WeChat payment? In practice, you would almost never set up directly on WeChat payment. So you, you can create a native account uh, on WeChat payment cross-border, uh, but this actually takes a lot of time and uh, the API provided by WeChat is not as good as some of their official partners. So WeChat has official partners in every country or in most countries uh, to help them uh, basically implement WeChat payment. And there is an official website, which there will be a click clickable link you will get in the presentation I will send you, uh, where you can find a list of all of these partners per country. So you can click on the country where you want to settle the money. And then you can uh, contact some of the partners uh, in this country and see compare the terms. So that's why I say the commission is around 2%, but it's never exactly the same because depending who you reach out to, you might get a lower commission. And these partners, because they get lower commissions from WeChat, sometimes they are, and very often, they are more competitive than if you set up directly with WeChat. If you set up directly with WeChat, you're going to have uh, most likely a commission around 2.5%, 3%. But if you set up with these partners, you might have be as low as around 1%, depending on how aggressive they are. So it's interesting for you to do due diligence. If you are not sure who to pick, you can reach out to us. Obviously, we integrate with a lot of the uh, cross-border payment partners who are supported by WeChat. We have around, I think, 15 or 20 integrations right now uh, for different regions. And we try to pick the ones which are offer the best terms. So if you have questions later, uh, you can reach out. I don't know all of the partners and the best regions on the top of my head, so it's better if you send an email, uh, and um, and we can uh, we can guide you because it's a, lot of, it's a very fragmented space. Uh, so once you're set, set up with payments, and you have to obviously ship your products to uh, to uh, China, uh, so you can do that via uh, cross-border shipping. Uh, here you have two broad types of shipping. 
Uh, one is called cross-border import. Uh, so this means that you have the product registered by the customs. You ask the customer to submit their ID um, uh, number and real name. So our system, for instance, has a system to check the validity of the ID. Um, and then uh, you properly clear customs. Uh, and then you will be basically uh, charge a, a fixed tariff on 9.1% on all of the, no matter the category, except if it's very high-end cosmetics, you will be charged a, a flat 9.1% rate. Uh, and the other option is to go through the, what's called the postal channel. Uh, it's like uh, considered a personal import. So you just basically ship the product uh, and you don't clear customs. And then some of the parcels are gonna get checked, some not. And if they get checked, then they will have to pay a quite high uh, fee, which will range between 50% to 60%. But because not, all, uh, not of the parcels get checked, uh, then uh, it can actually be cheaper than the cross-border import. Because if you have only 10% of your parcels being checked uh, and you pay 60%, in total, you just pay 6% actually of the order value uh, in taxes. Uh, depending on how you approach it, you can have your logistic provider take care of paying this fee when the, the parcel is being checked, or you might have as uh, the, um, the customer paid, uh, but you should avoid that because it can make the customer quite frustrated if their product is being held as the customs and then they have to pay an extra 60% in order to get it out. And very often they will try to return the product and get a refund uh, if you do that. Uh, the clean way to do it is to use a cross-border import. And that's what most of our clients do. Uh, it's, it's a much smoother way to clear customs. Uh, in terms of where you would ship from in practice, uh, this will depend uh, on a bunch of factors, but mostly what is the volume you're moving to China and what is the price of your product. Uh, if your product is relatively expensive uh, and um, you have, you're very new to China, you will want to keep your warehouse in Europe, US, the products in, in, in uh, Europe, US. And um, I say Europe, US, obviously it could be different countries, uh, but this is where a lot of our clients are located. That's why I, I use this, this shorthand. Um, and the shipping time will be a bit longer, uh, five, to five, five to 10 days usually, uh, depending on, on the origin point of the, of the order. Uh, but then you don't have to deal with a separate inventory for China. Uh, the middle point will be you set up a uh, uh, warehouse in Hong Kong, and then you will have a much faster shipping time, maybe four to seven days. Uh, and you can, you can, you can share the, the, this warehouse with other uh, countries. So it can ship to mainland China, but it can also sh ship to uh, Thailand, Vietnam, Indonesia, wherever you want to, uh, to ship your products. And it's also easy if you want to take it out and send it back to US, France, et cetera. You just have to ship the products. Uh, and the last option is to have a bonded warehouse. So this would be a, a warehouse which is uh, considered cross-border, but which is already on, on uh, Chinese uh, mainland China soil. But in this case, um, if you want to take the products out, it would be very complicated. You basically committed these products to mainland China and you're having faster shipping times, but you are losing a lot of the flexibility. Uh, in practice, most of our clients start with the first option and then they move to the second one. And only if they get move very large volumes, would they start with a bonded warehouse uh, because they don't want to, they want to be sure that this inventory is gonna move quickly and, and be, be sold. And they're not gonna have unsold, item, unsold items and they ha then have to ship out uh, of mainland. Uh, I added uh, a quotation here from one of our logistic partners, shipping from LA. Uh, this is not something you're, I'm gonna go through because it's, it would be quite boring. Uh, but I yeah, just put it here, you'll get the slides, so it will give you a sense of how much uh, a typical um, uh, logistic partner might charge to ship from China. And this is, from LA, the logistic, logistic uh, route is quite uh, efficient. So actually we can get products shipped five to, uh, within five to eight days, uh, which is relatively fast for a cross-border order and gives uh, quite a bit of flexibility to the, to the client uh, because you can keep the, the inventory in the U.S. warehouse and it's quite smooth. Um, to conclude, I will just very quickly talk about some new WeChat features. Uh, so WeChat live streaming, I already talked about in my last webinar. Uh, it's a relatively new feature from WeChat. Uh, it's not very mature uh, and similar to Taobao live streaming or Douyin live streaming, uh, it's mostly being used to product to to um, 
to uh, promote relatively affordable items. So this is a, a very small campaign from a small influencer we did for a client. Uh, the live stream, in, live stream lasted for around 87 minutes, generated uh, 300 orders. Uh, average order was 250 uh, renminbi. Uh, so it's low cost way to generate sales because uh, a lot of the live streams on WeChat are not very expensive and they can be comm commission based but uh, it's, it could be much more efficient with affordable items. So if you're selling items which are in the range of 100, 200, 300 US dollars, uh, it will be hard for you to get very high return on investment on these live streams. Uh, if you decide to, do, to go for it anyway, a few rules in order to be successful when live streaming uh, is to provide a large choice of items within one general category. Usually the live streamer will not talk about one brand only. As because you want to get people entertained and it would be hard to keep people attention for more than an hour if you're just talking about um, if you're just talking uh, about uh, one brand. Also, uh, by the way, congratulations everyone for still being here. We still have around 350 people here uh, after more than an hour. So thanks for your patience. We're almost done. Um, you will be able to, uh, you, you should try to preview some hero items and discounts and keep them from the end of the live stream. So usually if you have a special brand or special item that you want to promote, you know that people are more excited about that and they're waiting up for it. You should preview the fact that this special item is gonna be featured with a special discount and wait till the end to show it so that people wait for it and, and go through the entire thing. Um, and uh, keep, using the, keep the user engaged during the live streams by providing some limited time, limited amount discounts so people have to really be there, be aware, so they have to click on something so they can um, so that they can get the discount. And uh, if they just back on the back of their chairs watching, not really paying attention, they will not be able to, to benefit. So when you give discounts, you should be careful they don't apply to everyone on the live stream. Ideally, some people should try to get it, but it should run out so that you can really keep people on the edge of the seat. Uh, and if you run the live stream for one single brand, which is possible sometimes make sure to make it very special. Uh, go to the brand showroom, uh, go to the brand factory, talk with the founder, do something very, very unique uh, so that you can really stand out. Uh, especially a lot of influencers are living in, in countries which are not uh, mainland China. Uh, so you can find these influencers who are living close to you, ask them to visit you uh, and use them for live streaming uh, rather than having a long live stream about your brand from someone who's based in mainland China and who will just be showing the products in kind of informational way, but this won't sell as well. Like the, the only the very big live streamers can sell product efficiently using this kind of approach. And I will finish with uh, the WeChat short videos, uh, which is a feature I don't really like, but um, so I'm so sorry, I, I realized as I was proofreading the slides that I was finishing on a negative note. Uh, but uh, that's unfortunately, unfortunately inevitable. Uh, the videos, are, the way basically which I decided to do it is by having an interface which is very different from TikTok, but which doesn't work as well. Uh, the videos don't really occupy the entire screen, so it's not as engaging. Uh, the transitions don't have this kind of swipe motion, which is very smooth from TikTok, where you just you swipe, you swipe, and you have this endless loop of videos. Uh, and even the call to actions are not as obvious as on TikTok. So you have to click on some specific submenu in order to access uh, so the sharing call to action, uh, which is really not intuitive when they should try to maximize people liking and sharing, uh, but somehow they didn't really uh, build the interface in, in order to enable that. So it's a bit of a disappointing feature. Uh, it's not really uh, powerful in terms of, uh, it's not getting much traction. Uh, one of the reasons also, it doesn't have the, this kind of like uh, video editing capabilities and the filters that you can see on uh, on TikTok and Doin. Uh, I'm personally not a huge fan of filters. I use filters for the first time in my life in order to take the screenshots. But uh, really, the, the, all the content creators really appreciate uh, being able to use this kind of editing capabilities inside the app. And we shot short, short videos is not there yet uh, compared to where we are. Uh, with uh, TikTok doing quite short. Uh, so for now, it's kind of a weak feature and not something I would encourage to really spend a lot of time on. Uh, and I'm gonna 
uh, really quickly conclude before I get to the questions. Uh, so just to summarize what I said, uh, which I brought is slowing down, but it is the number one social network in China. It is the best uh, for e-commerce traffic, especially if you're trying to sell more expensive items. Uh, foreign businesses can create service accounts to promote their brand. You don't have much choice if you're outside of China. Uh, WeChat mini programs are must have if you're trying to sell on WeChat because of the good integration with influencer campaigns and the extra speed and, and improved UX. Uh, WeChat influencers are the most expensive, but as I said, yeah, the best for selling more expensive items. WeChat ads are expensive and have relatively low conversion rates uh, if you stay on WeChat. So I would really encourage you to use them mostly for retargeting after you run, for instance, influencer campaigns or to retargeting your JD audience on WeChat. So there are some really smart ways to use WeChat uh, uh, as in a, in a relevant way, but don't just try to uh, buy the ads and blast uh, whatever whoever is your audience, like a woman between uh, 18 to 25 years old uh, living in tier one cities because uh, this won't, won't really work. Um, WeChat cross-border sales are a very efficient way to get started in China uh, because they have very, very low setup. And as you can see, by leveraging the tools we mentioned, cross-border payments, very uh, good logistic partners, um, integration with Shopify Magento, you can really get started fast at a relatively low expense. Uh, and WeChat live streaming and short videos are still early stage uh, features with relatively low tractions. Uh, so you can keep an eye on them, but most likely, uh, not invest too much attention or effort in them uh, at this stage at least. Uh, okay, so there are now 78 questions in the backlog, so I will try to answer some of them. Uh, this is a bit of a painful part of the presentation each time because I have to read the question and you have to wait while I decide which one to answer because I try to answer the one which are relevant to everyone. Uh, but I start with that and I try to answer as many questions as I can, uh, and after a while, I will collapse of being tired, and people are going to start to leave the live the the webinar uh, because I'm, I'm quite still deprived. Uh, but I will go for a while, and we'll see how many people stick around. I guess when there are less than 250 people on the webinar, I, I will start to to close it. Um, uh, yeah, um, let's go. Uh, so a question. Uh, uh, what is different between an app and a mini program? So mini program is hosted by, by WeChat and you open it inside WeChat, while an app is hosted by whoever is a app provider and uh, you open it as something completely separate. Um, do you suggest WeChat mini program for a B2B company having more than 300,000 products in the offer? Uh, yeah, definitely. I think uh, especially for B2B, uh, you can use mini programs, but uh, for in different ways. You can use them as a way to um, actually uh, sell the products if you can. Uh, it's going to be more challenging, but you can also use it uh, as a tool for your sales. So if you're B two B, I assume you have you have salespeople who are promoting the products, and chances are, if people are selling in China, they are using WeChat to talk with the clients. And uh, if you want to make it easy for your salespeople to share information about your product. Having a mini program can be a very good way to do that. So that's what I would look at, not simply the, the direct sales of the product, which I think is gonna be more complicated for B2B just because of the invoicing payment systems. Uh, I don't know the details of your, of your life cycle, but it can be quite interesting as a tool to be provided to uh, 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 the mini program. Um, is HTML5 used to create a mini program? No, it's two different technologies. HTML5 is one technology, it's a web-based technology. Mini programs are using a specific JavaScript uh, framework provided by Tencent. Um, pa, pa, pa. Uh, is there any limitations to what database we use when we build a mini program? Uh, no, there is no uh, limitation. Uh, the question says MongoDB with a non-GS API. Uh, that's exactly what we use for on our software. We use Mongo with, uh, with Node.js uh, loopback. Uh, so yeah, you're completely free in terms of the database you use. That's the point I was making earlier. If you build a mini program, you can build it on any kind of technology. Um, bah, bah, bah. Let's go for different types of questions. Um, can 
I have a very good question. Can live streaming only apply for domestic goods and not apply to cross-border goods at this moment? Uh, yeah, I believe that's correct. Like right now, you, you can't actually do live streaming for with a cross-border mini program. So that's uh, that's actually completely correct. So it's a very very good question. Um, blah blah blah. Um, is there a percentage benchmark of fake followers that should sound the bells for brands? Um, yeah, any number of fake followers should be alarming for brands. Uh, the thing is, you should, the point is not the number of fake followers, is that you should pay the right price for what you're buying. So as I said, if you have an influencer who has 500K followers, but 300K uh, are fake, it's not a problem in itself. This influencer might be great and might convert really well, but you should confront them with this situation. Uh, if you see that from the data and negotiate a discount of the price so that you're paying a cheaper price usually that you're paying for 200K. So it doesn't matter the percentage. What matters is um, uh, what, what, you're, uh, what you're paying for. If, if you realize that 80%, 90% of the followers are fake, of course, it's going to be, it starts to get very difficult to, to tell what's fake and what's not. So in this case, you might not want to work with the influencer this influencer, but if it's like 30%, uh, sometimes the influencer might still be good actually for, the, for this campaign. Um, uh, are healthcare company allowed to be advertised via influencer or WeChat ads? Uh, via influencer, technically not, but in practice you can. So it's, uh, it's uh, you know, in China, like the, the law which matters is mostly the one which is being enforced. Uh, and via WeChat ads, no, definitely you won't go through the, through the WeChat reviews if you are trying to advertise health products via, via WeChat ads. Um, Ciao Thomas, can overseas companies create WeChat accounts and from store or, so, or just Chinese companies? So yeah, overseas companies can create uh, WeChat stores as we mentioned with, with cross-border payments. Um, what is the budget to develop a mini program and which software provider should an international brand rely on? Uh, this will depend on whether or not you're using something off the shelf. Uh, so if you're using a software as a service solution like ours, in which case it might be just a few thousand US dollars to get you started. Um, or if you want to build something custom. If you want to build something custom, there is no limit to the budget. It's like asking what is the price to develop an app. It can be 55,000 USD, 50,000 USD, 500,000 USD. It depends on the complexity of what you're building. Um, is it possible to help developers selling houses or condos units through WeChat? Uh, it is possible in practice. I think right now, TikTok, Doin can be a better um, network for that uh, because they have uh, a more visual uh, type of advertising. So if, our, if we are to, to promote a real estate right now, we would use TikTok rather than WeChat, uh, simply because it's not really about converting sales, it's just about lead generation, and uh, Doin can be an efficient way to do that uh, right now. So if you're interested in that, you can reach out. We have a specific offer for TikTok ads for real estate in China. Um, uh, how should I do retargeting more efficiently? If you don't have a JD store, then you should use uh, retargeting based on people visiting your mini program. Uh, bah, bah, bah. Uh, you mentioned that WeChat has a native connection with JD. Uh, do customers case care if they buy through JD or via Tmall Taobao? Most customers will not care too much. Uh, they will just look for the most convenient, cheaper price uh, with faster delivery speed. But most customers are comfortable buying through both platforms, especially if you're talking about higher price items because then you're, you're, uh, you're reaching uh, uh, wealthier customers who tend to be using um, JD and, and uh, Tmall indefinitely. Uh, people will care between Taba and Tmall. Of course, Taba is more a C2C platform, so people are less likely to buy products which are uh, on uh, Taba than on uh, Tmall if, if they get the choice at a similar price. Uh, blah, blah, blah. Um, yeah, that's pretty much it, I think. I think we went through most of the 
very, very relevant questions. There are some uh, questions which are uh, more specific, but um, uh, but I will, I will skip them because I, I will skip to the questions which are uh, relevant to most people. Um, yeah. Uh, okay, so I think we'll wrap up if that's fine. We are, the number of attendees uh, slipped to just above 200 now. So I think yeah, we're getting, uh, starting to see the audience live. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, everyone, for attending. Um, as I said, the slides will be sent to everyone. Uh, if you're interested in the previous webinar, you can find it on YouTube, on the Walk the Chat YouTube account. Um, and uh, the audio is a bit, uh, it's not perfect because I, my, my uh, headphone was not very, bad, very good at the time, but hopefully you should still get the gist of what uh, I'm saying. Um, and uh, yeah, you'll be, because you're already on a mailing list, you will be updated on future webinars which most likely will be on doing TikTok, but uh, not, not decided yet. Thanks a lot for your time and for your attention. If you have any questions, feel free to write us an email, follow our official account. And uh, yeah, thanks again for bearing with me for more than an hour. And uh, especially if, if the time might not be convenient for everyone because we're trying to accommodate as many locations as possible. Thank you everyone, bye-bye.